there is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace, for that is what I long to do. I give you praise For you are my righteousness I worship you Almighty God there is none like you. I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, the Prince of Peace. Here's why. For that is what I long to do. I give you praise for you are my righteousness I worship you almighty God there is none like you, there is none like you. Hallelujah, Lord. And no one else can touch my heart like you do. For I can search for all eternity long. And find there is none. Oh, there is none. There is none. Oh, there is none. There is none. Hallelujah. Oh, there is none. There is none like Jesus, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus, there is something about that name, hallelujah, Master. Savior Jesus like the fragrance after the rain Jesus 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 let all heavens, hallelujah, and earth proclaim that kings and kingdoms, they will all pass away. But there's something about 
that name. I want you to help me say that. Jesus, 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 there is something, hallelujah, about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus. Like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven, hallelujah, God, and earth proclaim that kings and kingdoms they will all pass away but there's something about that name kings had kingdoms they will all pass away but there's something about that name oh kings had kingdoms hallelujah Every one of them will all pass away. But there's something about that I worship you. Almighty God. There is none like you. Kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there is something about that name. What a worship. We are so grateful to the Lord for this opportunity to share with you. I just felt like playing and singing and worshiping God. We have great praise teams and wonderful praise and worship leaders and an amazing band. But I have learned that the praise team and the band are not in your house with you. Not even the preacher is with you in your own personal space. Each of us has to be able to utilize our own gift. And it might not be to the proficiency of someone else's gift, but each of us has, has access to God through worship. And tonight was just one of those nights that I just felt like getting in the presence of the Lord. And certainly I'm grateful because I can feel the presence of the Lord right where I am. And my prayer is that you can feel God's presence where you are. Well, welcome to Wednesday Night Live. I'm grateful to the Lord for this opportunity for us to share together. I want to thank you for your continued support of the ministry and how you uh, continue not only to bless us by logging on and by subscribing to our channel, but how you bless us as well uh, through your contributions and your generosity. We appreciate that. And there are opportunities for you to do that at your leisure. The information will be on the screen. I want to pray and I want to get right into the word of God because I have something very neat that the Lord has given me to share with you. And I want to make haste as we go into the word of God. So can we pray together? Lord, thank you today. Thank you for what our eyes have already seen and ears have heard for how we have experienced your presence, how we have felt your love and how we are surrounded by uh, your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, as we enter into this time of teaching and sharing in the word of God, my prayer is that you would illuminate the word of God for us in such a way that it would minister to the depths of who we are and who you want us to be. Thank you for that. In Jesus name. Amen. Well, I want you to get your Bibles and go with me to the book of Hebrews. We're going to go 
uh, to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to look at chapter 9. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 9. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Now, we've been talking about these various elements surrounding our soteriology, which is a fancy word for the study of salvation. We've been looking at uh, some different components about the finished work of Christ and what uh, the redemptive work means for us. We talked about the cross the first week. Last week, we looked at the cup. This week, I want to talk about the covenant, okay, the covenant. And there's so much reading, honestly, I mean, <laughs> I really want to read all of chapter nine, but I'm not going to do that in your hearing. And so I'm going to ask that you at your own leisure will make this a part of your Bible study this week. Go back and read chapter nine of Hebrews because it is so important and to really understand it. It's about 28 uh, verses or so, but you really get a clean and clear understanding of the word when you read it in its context of the entire chapter. But for the sake of reading here tonight, uh, I am going to read. Uh, beginning at verse number 11, and I am going to uh, conclude, uh, I don't know, maybe around, whew, so much, I'm sorry, maybe around 17 or so. We'll call that a day and see how that works, all right? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11, but Christ came as a high priest of good things to come, with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and cows, but with his own blood, that's important, with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Inheritance, excuse me. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Let's grab 18. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. I may as well keep on reading. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of cows and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and the vessels of ministry, and according to the law, and almost all things are purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. And he goes on. Glory to God. Now, I, I'll stop. I'll stop there. I may cover some of it in my teaching. Tonight, I want to talk from the thought connected by a covenant. Okay? Connected by a covenant. That's my subject. Okay? Uh, connected by a covenant. We are connected by a covenant. Now, uh, what I want you to understand, particularly in the book of Hebrews, it's important that if we're going to approach this book, that we do so understanding both the times and the context. You must understand that uh, the Christian faith was born out of or birthed out of Judaism. And that at the beginning of the early church, uh, the Christian church, which at that time was just considered more like a sect or in some ways considered more like a cult. It, it, it was just a group of come outers, people identified as followers of the way. They were later called Christians at Antioch. And what you must understand is that uh, for the most part, the early church was very Jewish. To that end, 
the book of Hebrews is dedicated to just that, to the Hebrews, to the Jews, and it is written to them to help them understand how Christ is better. And it's done in the attempt to encourage them not to go back or to hold on to that in which they have come out of. If I were preaching here tonight, and I'm not, I'm just going to teach, but if I were preaching, that would be a good starting point to tell you that the Lord sends God's word to us to enable us in part that we may continue to move forward in the will of God and not hold on to the former things. Can I get an amen there? God's trying to bring you into better. That's what Hebrews is all about, that Jesus Christ is the better that God is bringing us into. We talked last week about the better being on the other side of the bitter. Well, I want you to see that then imagine for you to have gone through so much uh, bitter to come into better only to want to hang on to what was former and not actually live within the reality of what God has for you. Now, this is the essence. And as a result, then the book of Hebrews is replete with um comparisons and with and uh, with uh, uh, juxtapositions between the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament systems and the New Testament, primarily the Old Testament priesthood and the New Testament. And it is in this particular chapter that this unknown writer of Hebrews begins to help us understand the power of covenant. He says for the first covenant, talking about the law of Moses, speaking about the old covenant, the covenant God made with people. And then ultimately he goes on to talk about this new covenant made with Christ. The thing I want you to see in this, if you don't see anything else tonight, is that we serve a covenant keeping God. We serve a God of covenant. Now, I know this word is probably lost on the uh, ears of some because we live in the day and in the time now where covenants don't seem to be honored. And for that matter, some covenants seem to be avoided. People don't want to really get into a covenant. They don't want to have to make a true commitment. They don't want to have to to create a covenant whereby there's some sense of sacrifice. And, and, and that's really what a covenant is about, even more than a commitment. With a covenant, there's usually some sign or sacrifice. Such with marriage, you leave your mother and father and cleave unto your wife. And then the intimacy that you share, the consummation of that marriage becomes as a a sign of the covenant glory to God when you're talking about in Abraham's day then the sign of the covenant was circumcision when God made a covenant with Abraham God required that Abraham cut his foreskins and we see that sign being attached to the covenant when God brought children of Israel out of Egypt they had the Passover and and they began to have other feasts and festivals these were signs that reminded them in these holy days of the covenant when John the Baptist comes along and begins to usher in this paradigm shift into the message and into the era uh, of the kingdom uh, of God, speaking now not just merely of the Judaistic faith, but that God, in fact, has a master plan that will ultimately include Jews and Gentiles. What is the sign of that covenant? Baptism. You see, every covenant comes with a sign. And what I want you to see is that is the depth of covenant. And we live in a day and in a time now where people shy away from covenants. They try to avoid them at all costs. And when we enter into them, sometimes we don't take them as seriously. And I want to suggest that's a dangerous thing. The reason is because if we devalue the power of covenant, then we will begin to question what the relationship is between God and us. Most people who wrestle with whether God loves them or not, particularly in light of certain sins, failures, faults, or frailties, most of those people are people who also don't have a real, true, in-depth understanding of covenant. Because when God enters covenant with us, God is so committed to God's word that the Bible says even heaven and earth will pass away before the word of God will fail. 
If you understand the covenant you have with God and the covenant God has with you, you won't wake up every day to question whether or not God loves you. There are different kinds of covenants in the scripture. You have unilateral covenants, which is uh, a one-sided covenant where God just says, I will do this for you because you belong to me. And then you have bilateral covenants where, where if you do, I will do. But the Bible has covenants. Now, what this text in particular begins to show us is that the first covenant, the old covenant, the word of God. And if you have a Bible, you know your Bible is split into covenants, the old covenant or testament, and then the new covenant or testament. And what it says is that the old covenant had an earthly sanctuary that had a tabernacle in it. Some versions use the word tent. It had a tent of meeting or tabernacle with which God used the priesthood to exercise the signs contained within this covenant. He he talks uh, in the early part of this chapter about the furniture that's in the tabernacle and, and, and ultimately the Ark of the Covenant that was in the tabernacle. You know the Ark of the Covenant was given in the days of Moses. God gave instruction and in the Ark uh, it contained several things built of uh, acacia wood overlaid in gold, uh, glory to God, which had the pot that had the manna, it had Aaron's rod that budded, it had the tablets of the Ten Commandments of the Old Covenant, and it above it had the cherubim, the angels covering, overshadowing the mercy seat, and these are things, he said the revelation is so deep I couldn't even speak in great detail about it, okay, these are the things that were contained in the Ark of the Covenant. And they kept the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle with them in the most holy place. And as a consequence, he said that the priest would minister in the in the first room of the tabernacle. However, they could not go into the most holy place. Only the high priest could go and had to go alone. And the high priest had to go alone only once a year on the day of atonement to atone for the sins of the people and the sins of the priest. Now, I want to slow down for just a moment and park my brake right there. I've got a moment to do so because I would I would remind us in a day and in an age now where we keep expecting the servants of the Lord to be perfect, that even in the Bible days, the priest had sins, too. And the priest had the responsibility to atone for the sins of the people and atone for the sins of the priests. The high priest had mess and the high priest had failures and the high priest had faults. And I'm not saying this as a blank check, as a get out of jail free card for people in leadership who sin. The reason I bring it up is because I think we ought to bring our expectations down just a little bit. There's only one saved and his name is not the name of your pastor glory to Jesus there's one redeemer I used to hear my father say when I was a child and people would talk about some scandal or some failure or some flaw or some moral situation that a leader might be caught up in my father would say until you bring me a newspaper article or a magazine article with a picture of Jesus in a hotel room or coming out of a crack house or in some other compromised situation i'm gonna still serve the lord oh it's not an excuse for the priests we all ought to live according to the word of god but i would remind you with your holy self that even with your holy self you too fall short for the bible said that there is no one who does completely good and never sins each of us all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of god and because of it the priest couldn't just atone on behalf of the sins of the people the priest had to get it right too glory to God and the priest atoned on the day of atonement for the priest's own sins he said in verse 9 however this was all symbolic for the present time here goes this idea of better that what we see in the Old Testament system according to the Old Testament covenant was really just a shadow to bring us into a reality for which Christ becomes the reality and the ultimate consummation of the sacrifice. And this, my brothers and sisters, is what we pick up reading. 
where it says that Christ came as the high priest of the good things to come and with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands. So what I want you to see, and this is a good Bible study moment, that what you often see in the Old Testament that's physical, you see in the New Testament is literal. So in the Old Testament, the tabernacle is made with hands. It's a tent. It's a physical tent that they picked up and took with them. Hundreds of years later, they would build a, a temple, a physical building. But all of it becomes a shadow. It's, 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 it's even the furniture that was uh, in the tabernacle. All of it becomes a shadow. The furniture that was, that, that was a, a part, the, the Ark of the Covenant, all of it becomes symbolic for something greater in the New Testament. In the New Testament, that in which was a physical or tangible becomes spiritual and transformative. Did you hear what I said? In the Old Testament, that which is physical and tangible in the New Testament becomes spiritual and it becomes transformative. So it's not something you pick up and take with you and or it's not about where you physically are. I say that because while we are yet amidst this pandemic, it's important that you understand that God's covenant with you doesn't stop because your access to a building is limited. Whether or not you can get into a physical sanctuary to worship isn't really of that great of importance as you think. What really matters is the sanctuary in our hearts. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving, I'll be. You see that? I'll be. Not go to. I'll be be a living sanctuary god says i'm trying to turn this into physical from from a physical realm into a spiritual realm even when we take the lord's supper even when we take the holy eucharist and we eat the bread and we drink the cup it's not about the the that cracker and about that juice it's what it represents it's transubstantiation it's what it represents for us it 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 it, it is it is the picture Okay, that we believe when we eat and when we drink it, that it symbolizes or becomes the Lord's body for us in a spiritual realm. If you understand that and you're in a position to type, put in my comment section, stay in the spirit. Stay in the spirit. Don't, why do all of this work for Christ to bring us into the spiritual realm, into the reality, and then we get stuck in the carnal realm? This is what Paul later talks about in one place, uh, I believe in uh, Colossians, when he talks about how we as believers are not obligated to observe the holy feasts and festivals and the new moons and the Sabbaths that we see uh, in the Old Testament. It's nothing wrong with observing it, but we're not obligated to observe it because those things, he said, were a shadow a shadow it was not the reality now you know anything about a shadow you go outside when it's sunny to have a shadow you have to have the reality somewhere but the shadow is not the reality the shadow is the sign that the reality is around the corner jesus is the reality but to show us that god had a redemptive plan god sets up all of this work in the old covenant so that he could show us what he had in mind for us. Whoo, this is good to my spirit, y'all. I know this is kind of deep for some, and I'm teaching real meat tonight. This isn't milk of the word. This is this is big boy, big girl food. Glory to God. This is restaurant dining. Glory to God. This is the kind of teaching that when you understand this, it begins to shape your relationship with God. You'll never be the same again because you begin to understand that ultimately what connects me to God isn't the physical things. And this is the point I want you to get tonight. What connects you to God through Jesus Christ is not in the lower realm glory to god it is not in the lower realm this is why he says here that 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 christ has has come into the perfect tabernacle not made with hands not of the creation but verse 12 not with the blood of goats and cows but with his own blood 
He said, I've got something better than that in which you're able to, to make or create or raise or, or, um, or, or farm. Okay, I'm not here to deal with anything from, from your livestock. I'm bringing something better than that. And he entered the most holy place. He, I'm, and he does this. In verse 13, he says, if the, blood, if the blood of the bulls and goats and ashes of the, hef, of the heifer sprinkling the unclean can sanctify the flesh, how much more can uh, the blood of Christ sanctify and cleanse our conscience? It's a spiritual thing. That's what I want you to see is that this is a spiritual thing. This is not about something in the flesh. My connection to God isn't based off of the tangible things of the flesh. Glory to God. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. And what the enemy wants to do is the enemy wants to create enough tangible, physical, natural, carnal realities in our lives as distractions so that we forget about the value we have in the spirit. So we'll get caught up whether it's somebody caught up in titles and positions or whether it's somebody caught up in deeds. And I believe in being moral. I believe in healthy character. But I would tell you that ultimately Jesus is greater than morality. The Pharisees were just as moral as you could get in some eyes, too moral, too technical to the place of being legalistic. Uh, it's not about how many T's you cross or how many I's you dot. The goal, the goal is about the word of God getting down into your heart. This is a spiritual thing. Are you hearing me tonight? And be hasten. This spiritual thing that Jesus does then as a consequence, this is what I want you to see. How better it is in the old covenant. In the old covenant, the priests had to come and make sacrifices. They had their, uh, their regular sacrifices, their daily sacrifices. But then you had in the most holy place, the yearly sacrifice of atonement. But what I want you to see is that Jesus comes in the spirit of better things. And Jesus introduces us into a new covenant by his own purified blood having been offered as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world and as a result the bible said he entered the holy place a spiritual holy place once and for all god said i did it once for all i'm not i don't need to come back and do this again Thank you, Jesus. Jesus doesn't die on a cross again every time somebody sins. He's not coming back to Calvary to die to help get it right for somebody when they fall. Jesus said, I did this once for all. I'm not coming back to do this again. My blood is so efficacious. The blood of Jesus is so efficacious, glory to God, that the blood does not have to be shed again. The blood just has to be applied. This is where the old saints would talk about when they would get to pleading the blood of Jesus. When they say, I plead the blood like I plead my case before a judge. I plead the blood to be my case. I'm, I'm, I'm appropriating the blood of Jesus. That 2,000 year old blood is still efficacious to the place that it reaches. I'm sorry, y'all. I feel like preaching, don't I? To the highest mountain and it flows back down to the lowest valley. That same blood can reach across all types of cultural barriers, color barriers, race barriers, age barriers, all types of social economic status barriers or anything else that exists. God says, I am able to send my blood. This is why the church better be careful who you try to put your mouth on and declare who can be saved and who can't be saved. Who died and made your bishop jesus who died who died and made your pastor jesus who died and made your mama and them jesus who died and left your cousin and them in charge jesus said only i get to decide who ultimately makes it in and who doesn't it's not your job to determine who is and who isn't saved why because neither one of us are intelligent enough to know just how deep the blood can go 
The blood of Jesus will reach people who we never get to see walk down the aisle. The blood of Jesus will reach people who we never get to see testify or come back to our church or, or, or be a part of our ministry or in some way connect with us because the connection they need, uh-uh, I'm about to get in trouble, isn't a church connection. Woo! It's a covenant connection. I thank God for the church. We need the church. I love the body of Christ. Flaws and all. But let me be clear. The connection that matters is not the connection to the church. It's the connection to the Christ through the covenant of his shed blood on Calvary and just in case you never get to step foot in a church that does not mean you cannot be saved the Lord will save you where you are the Lord will wash your sins away and that same blood I'm talking about from that one sacrifice can be appropriated in your life today in Jesus name now let me get down to the crux of this it's because of this what I want is verse uh, number 15 it's because of this. For those of you just, just following me, I'm in Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 15 now. Because Jesus Christ has offered this better sacrifice and has become the lamb slain and his blood is now cleansing our conscience. This, he says, for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant. We're connected by a covenant. He is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. inheritance. What I want you to see is that we're connected by a covenant that Jesus himself died for and and i don't really think i have major points to really pull out of this but if i had to extrapolate i'm really just doing expository teaching tonight but if i were to extrapolate a point a relevant point then what i would tell you is that we are connected by a covenant that has been completed in jesus that your covenant is complete and completed by and in Jesus Christ. What does it mean? It means Jesus played all the parts. <laughs> Jesus got into this so intent was his sacrifice for us to usher us into this new covenant that Jesus didn't farm out or delegate any part of the covenant to anyone else. Jesus plays all the parts. He says, that's how intentional I am with you. Now, I'm going to turn a corner in a minute that it's going to be important for you as to why this matters. He said, I intentionally have created the space so that you could live in a new covenant. And by doing so, what I did is played all the parts. This is why he says he's, look at this, he's the mediator of the covenant by means of death. But then it goes on to, to, to say in verse 16, for where there is a testament, OK, uh, get in your mind when someone dies and they leave a will. It's called a last will and testament. Y'all ready? When you pick up your Bible, what you are picking up is God's will and testament. That's what we talk about, about being in the will of God. It's not just about being in uh, what being in God's will is bigger than just doing what God wants you to do. Being in the will of God is to think like a relative who dies and leaves you an inheritance. Now, somebody say God's not dead. You're absolutely right. He's still alive. That's why Jesus came to die. Woo! This is why Jesus came to die. This is the point I'm trying to make. Jesus dies so that God's will could now be disseminated because just as this verse tells us that you don't need the will if the person who creates the will is alive. Look at verse 16. For where there is a testament, there must also be the necessity of the death of the testator. If the testator is alive, if right now, if I have a will for my children, I've left them an inheritance in my will. If I'm dead, they don't get it. They only get it if I die. It requires the death of the testator 
for a testament is only in force after the person is dead so the testament has no power while the testator lives so what Jesus had to do I feel like running in this room what Jesus had to do God says I've got a will for you through Jesus Christ you're in the will you're included in the will but in order for this to be exacted then what I need is for Jesus to be the testator I need him to die so Jesus dies not just so that your sins could be washed. He dies so that everything that's a part of God's will. Can I hoop on a Wednesday? Because I feel like hollering, but I'm not. He dies so that everything in God's will gets appropriated to us. No death, no testament. This is why it's the death of Jesus that really brings to life the New Testament. You with me? Now, we had an Old Testament, and the way the Old Testament was alive was because there had to repeatedly be the death of an animal. Every time that innocent animal died, then the Old Testament or Old Covenant was able to live. But in the New Testament, Jesus says, we're not going to keep going around this circle over and over again with death. I'm going to die once. Thank you, Lord. And my one death on the cross will settle this forever. So I want you to see that being connected to a covenant with Christ is a covenant that is completed in and through Christ. How so? Because Jesus dies so that we can get the covenant. But then he rises. If I was a Baptist preacher, I'd say but early Sunday morning. He rises. Why does rising from the dead matter? Rising from the dead matters because it's his rising from the dead that allows him to be mediator. See, in verse 15, it called him the mediator of the will. But then in verse 16, it called him the testator. But you can't be a mediator if you're dead. This is why you often get uh, the the lawyer or someone like that to be an executor of the way you to, to, to be a mediator to help appropriate that a person's will gets uh, disseminated. So what he said is, I'm gonna play all the parts. <laughs> Jesus, woo, first of all, becomes the lamb that is the sacrifice. Jesus is also the high priest. Who offers the sacrifice. All in the text. He is the testator. Who ultimately has or puts the will into effect by his death. And he does so by making himself the sacrifice. And being the one to offer it as the high priest. This is a one man show. And then he then rises from the dead. According to the power of the father who raised him from the dead so that he can now be alive to be the mediator. Had Jesus not played one of those parts, we would have needed man to get mankind's hands in it. And you know, anytime man gets his hands or anytime one man gets her hands in anything, we mess it up. So what God said is, it's so important that this connection through the covenant be pure. I got to go. That as a consequence, I'll handle all the jobs myself to make sure. And the reason why we get to pray in the name of Jesus, the reason why we have power in the name of Jesus, the reason why we get to plead the blood of Jesus is because he both died as the sacrifice so that the will and testament could go into effect. And then he also lives rose again to be the mediator to make sure every promise is mine i close i close tonight but the reason why i share this and the good news is because if in fact jesus is all things relative to the covenant for us it means you don't have to live another day in your life waiting for people to to make you feel a part of god's covenant for you
That's my shout. That you don't need anybody else. You don't need a priest. You don't need a partner. You don't need a person to tell you who you are in Christ. Christ said, I did all the work. And the same way I died to make sure that the will and testament could be given to you, I'm going to also live to make sure you get what's yours. I close tonight, but I'm reminded years ago, my father preached for a great man of God who's gone on to glory by the name of Bishop Anthony Moses. And Bishop Moses sang a song, taught me a song. Oh God, it's been I don't know more than about 23 24 years ago taught a song I remember hearing and I might get some of the words wrong but my spirit rings of this song when I read this text and I think about how Jesus died so that the will could be made available and then rose so that he could help then to mediate that will and to make sure I get what belongs to me and I think of that song every promise in the book is mine Every chapter, every verse, every line, I am standing on his word divine. Every promise in the book is mine. That's, that's, that's the song I learned. And that's what I want to leave you with tonight. You ought to live your life resting on that fact. Every promise in the book is mine. Whatever God has for me in this book, it belongs to me. Why? Because Jesus died so that I could have that. I close. I wonder what parts of the covenant you have felt shut out of in what way have you allowed guilt condemnation alienation aggravation tribulation to create separation i want to tell you the devil is a liar the bible said there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in christ jesus none whatsoever i'm telling you jesus took care of that for us and god's will for you god's testament god's covenant for you cannot be broken by another I want to pray for you tonight that you stay connected to the covenant if you don't get to connect to the service if you don't get to connect to the prayer partner if you don't get to connect to the idea you had in mind for your life you know what matters what matters is that you stay connected to the covenant Lord tonight I simply pray in Jesus name as I have attempted to teach this word I pray in the name of Jesus that you would call us to a higher level of connection. Help us to not be connected to things that don't matter. Lord, help us to harness our spirits and to put ourselves in a posture where, where we're able to connect to the right thing. We're connected by a covenant. I'm not connected to you by a check. I'm not connected to you by uh, a job and my career or whether or not things are going well for me in the economic sphere. I'm not connected to you simply by the relationships I have and the friends I have, or even the family. And that is why nothing I lose has to take me away from my relationship with you because none of those things created that relationship. Lord, we are connected by covenant. Connected by covenant. And I thank you tonight. I thank you tonight for this covenant connection. Thank you for your blood. And we vow that nothing will separate us from the love of God. In Jesus name. Amen. If you don't know the Lord in the free pardon of your sin, this is all I've been preaching, teaching all night. Pray with me. God, I come in Jesus name. I confess you are the savior. I believe you died for me. And you rose on the third day. Come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. And I believe by your grace, through my faith, I am saved. You pray that prayer tonight. Welcome to the kingdom of God. If you rededicated your life to Christ, welcome home. If you want us to help steward your spiritual growth, whatever your spiritual decision is, I want you to text SKC decision to number 71441. Or I want you to, uh, I want you to uh, click the link. Uh, at the bottom of the comment section and uh, let us know you made a decision for christ okay i'm coming back next week we've already talked about the cross we've talked about the cup tonight we've talked about the covenant we're coming back next week i'm gonna talk about the crown you know we gotta crown him lord of all and we're gonna deal with that but until then i want you to stay connected let nothing remove you from your covenant with god be blessed